That what I'm suggesting is that there is evidence that this time lapse is the result of an altered state of consciousness. That the person, if you like, has a real time lapse because they've encountered some real physical force which has rendered them unconscious, probably. And in that period of unconsciousness, they may have had a sort of experience which would be duplicated by putting them under hypnosis and more or less putting, making them unconscious for a period of time. So the, the conditions are actually quite similar. So you can't take the similarity of data from the post-UFO experience consciously recalled and the post-UFO experience induced by hypnosis as necessarily being probative of that actually having physically happened. So uh, I sort of cautiously am interested in seeing further results of hypnosis data, but I would definitely not like it to be seen to be applied across the board to all these cases. Personally, I've never seen a witness who's actually been helped by hypnosis. Um, almost everybody I know who's gone through it has not felt better afterwards because it hasn't resolved the dilemma in their mind. That being the case, I don't really see the point of it. That's certainly an interesting case, which I think should be investigated, if it's true. I mean, that, that's obviously a little well, anomaly, was which... What actually happened in terms of, presumably, some sort of contact must have occurred between the taxi driver and the company he was working for? I mean, what did, what did the taxi company say? Could they, did they say they couldn't get hold of him? Or what? Because obviously that's, that's, that's crucial. Well, they're unconscious or in an altered... Yeah. Yes, I, I take that point exactly. I take the point exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that people are, you know, driving along and this thing goes zap and they suddenly go like that and they stop the car in the middle of the road. Otherwise, we'd have a lot of unexplained accidents. Clearly, that doesn't happen. Something else happens. Presumably, the witnesses are induced in some way to leave the road uh, maybe they're following this thing wondering what it is and the unconsciousness occurs only in close proximity uh, subsequently and that the memory is confused and distorted and they're actually driving for most of the time which is missing but they're forgetting it in the same way as Andy mentioned something about highway hypnosis yesterday where you can drive a long way without knowing it the funny tricks can be played on the mind and particularly if the mind is being affected by some sort of energy from elsewhere which is generating an altered state of consciousness it's difficult to predict what effect that would have I would make a point in this that someone also said yesterday about observed abductions there are a number of observed, uh, observed abductions where witnesses have been seen when, according to their testimony, they were inside a UFO. Uh, of the cases that I know of, every single one, the, the eyewitnesses saw the apparent abductee either in an altered state of consciousness, in a sort of trance-like state, or literally unconscious on the ground. Um, so we do have some hard evidence that this does happen. But I do take the problems that you've raised from that and I wouldn't for one minute suggest that you know that we should dismiss them. That's not actually true. There are some which do. There was a, for instance, we had a very good when we the first quintuplet that we discovered, which is a formation of a central one and four satellites on the outside. We thought that it had arrived in 1983. In actual fact, looking back at old photographs of one of the earlier circles, we found that that was a quintuplet, or rather would have been, but for the fact that where one of the satellites would have been was exactly where you say, over a hedge and lane at this side of the field, and therefore it was prevented from forming because of that. Uh, it is true, however, that you're right, that many of them do seem to relate themselves specifically to inside the fields as opposed to anywhere else, and that's presumably a product of the actual topography. If the meteorological explanation is correct and I believe it's correct in some cases. I don't 
at all attempt to suggest to you that it is responsible for all the crop circles because I don't believe it is. I do believe that there is an intelligence responsible for many of the other crop circles, probably, in my view, a majority of the crop circles that have appeared in recent years. Uh, I just happen to believe that an intelligence lives on Earth. Um, but in terms of the weather theory, um, I think that it's a complex interrelationship between atmospheric forces the actual resistivity of the crop itself at the right stage, the weather conditions at the time of formation, and the topography of the land. There have to be conditions which have to be fulfilled, which are specific and predictable in advance. And therefore, it's not, it's, it's not going to appear randomly in the way that you're suggesting. There are actual physical constraints upon the location where it can appear. One last question that the lady down here. It's not so much a question as a statement, it's what she was saying about um, perhaps other witnesses seeing someone in an altered state or perhaps mm. in I think sort of in relation to your whole um, lecture and talk, I think we should all accept that what those people are seeing, i.e. other people in an unconscious state or perhaps uh, lying flat on the ground mm. unconscious or in an altered state, may not be what they are seeing equally, that two people or a group of people can look at what someone else presents as one thing and all see completely different things and that mm we all of us may interpret one thing in completely different ways, not from any falsehood necessarily, not necessarily from any cultural imposition, although that might be a part of it, but mm. things affect us all differently depending on any number of things, and perhaps that we are all involved in a relationship with yeah. many, many different types of entities and situations which we perceive in many different ways. I would say, in conclusion, since I think this is the last question, is it, that... Um, I'm, I'm not making dogmatic statements here. I am telling you what, from the years of experience in the field, I've seen and how I personally evaluate the evidence. I will be the last to tell you that what I've just said now is the truth. Uh, you have to look at the facts, and I believe what I've given you today is the facts. I don't believe I've said anything which isn't true. Uh, you can decide upon that information yourself how you judge it. Compare it with other information you're going to hear the rest of this weekend. And it may well be that I'm wrong. It may well be that everybody else you hear this weekend is wrong. It may well be that there is an answer that none of us have thought of. I just happen to feel, my gut feeling is, looking at the evidence that I've seen, that this is at least some way toward the truth. And I can do no more than be honest to myself in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have an important thing, we have the raffle. Uh, my, my colleague Rodney is about to draw the, the raffle prizes. Eighty-nine. Eighty-nine. Number 38. My colleague has been bantering me for two days to mention this, uh, and I'm afraid I've forgotten. Before I have a, a new publication out, which is available, it's called UFO News File. And uh, it's available in the fire. I don't know the price, but I dare say someone will tell you. A pound. A pound. I'm sure it's worth it, but it's basically a, a news clipping service that will keep you informed of all the latest happenings in the newspapers, and if you believe any of it, well, that's your fault. <laughs> <coughs> now, also, one last announcement to make. When we have to break uh, after our next speaker, uh, my colleague in the foyer has to announce that the, the, the second-hand books that have been on sale will be, be sold at half price. Um, I'm really fainted when he told me that. There's something not quite right here. I think he's having an altered state of consciousness. That's really interesting. Some might say he's drunk, but there you are. He's scratched off. Now, I don't quite know. I, I thought for some time last night um, how to introduce our, our next speaker. Um, and I don't think I managed to, to, to get it right. Um, I think I'll leave it to say that he is the, the editor of The Lay Hunter. He has published two magazines on the topic of which I think he's about to, to speak on. He'd probably say something completely different and throw me off tack. But his first book that had to do 
with U.S. oil sweeping away, it was earth lights. And um, I think it's fair to say it caused a little bit of a stir. Uh, I think that's been conservative. This has seemed, since been uh, updated, if you like, with the latest work, the earth lights revelation. Again, we have copies available today. I'm not going to say anything more. I shall leave it to the gentleman himself. Uh, please welcome Mr. Paul Deverell. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I'd like to do first of all is do a very, very quick pre-see of what the Earth Light theory is about. Um, and it'll be very brief, and if you want more details you can get it in this, uh, and even this is only a summary. Uh, then I'd like to look at some of the characteristics of the phenomena we're looking at. And then I'd like to look at those phenomena in the context of ufology in general, the ETH and abductions in particular, uh, and also a quick mention on a slightly uh, tangential tack with crop circles. So, try and get through it. Uh, we talk about the Earth Lights theory, those of us, handful of us who are involved, and um, I use the term, but in fact there is no theory. What we have with Earth Lights, I think, is the framing of a question. Certainly no answers, but the identification that there is a phenomenon, whether it's part of a broader one or not, I won't go into, but there is a phenomenon occurring that we ought to give a handle to. Because as soon as you give a handle to something, you can get hold of it. And it's not been got hold of for, certainly since World War II, and I would say for millennia. But uh, that's another matter. Could we have the, uh, the picture? Yeah. I'm pressing. Okay, uh, very, very brief mini history of Earthlight's approach. Uh, I personally got involved in the early 1970s when I was conducting, uh, with other researchers, um, a study of uh, the county of Leicestershire. And uh, we were looking at many, many factors. It was a broad multidisciplinary study, we call it Earth Mysteries. Um, we're looking at uh, folklore and, and uh, ghost lore and uh, ancient sites, traditional gathering points, geology, seismology, meteorology, whole ranges of, of, of factors, including, of course, ufology, to look at one area of ground from many different layers and angles. Um, this work was done between 1973 and 1976, and uh, various publications came out from 1975 onwards with this material. Now, in the 1960s, I think it was 1968, I had read Ferdinand Lagarde's paper in Flying Source Review, where he mentioned that in France in 1954, low-level and landed UFOs seemed to fall uh, in areas associated with uh, geological fault lines. It was just a little factor, just one of these many papers one reads, and it just rang a little bell, but more or less forgot about it. But when we did this work, uh, I became more conscious of this possibility that we're used to looking upwards for UFOs, for the answer to the UFO question must be in outer space, must be up in the sky. And I thought perhaps uh, looking at it this way, we perhaps should also look at what we're standing on, that that may have a part to play in some of the phenomena, if not all the phenomena, that's reported. In uh, this case, we have the county of Leicestershire. The red lines on the left-hand map uh, depict the, 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 uh, the faulting in the, uh, in the county. Uh, Charlotte Forest, uh, a heavily faulted, very ancient area of exposed rock. The sort of uh, greyish coloured shapes are areas that we found from going through files, archives, going back 400 years, were areas of the county where repeatedly, over that period of time, unusual phenomena that we might possibly think was geophysical had been reported. So they represent what seemed to have been the geophysical activity zones of the county. On the right-hand map, the dark shapes, uh, just drawn over the top, represent the uh, highest incidence areas of reported UFO activity for a 25-year period. 
Now, uh, not, none of this is proof of anything as such, but it alerted me personally to the fact that I found that a very interesting pattern that emerged. They were complicating matters, like Leicester is here. So it obviously has an effect in terms of population or what gets reported or doesn't get reported. Um, but also there are areas where there's low population that were also high incidence areas of reported UFO activity. What they all related to was the apparent geological and geophysically active areas of the county as reported for four centuries. So I got very interested in this. This was my personal introduction to this, to, to this idea. As uh, time went on, I became more uh, involved. I was given uh, the contract to do a book on this subject area after a number of ups and downs and that uh, concern and uh, so on from, from publishers. But one publisher did give me the go-ahead to have, have a go at this, Alec Bartholomew. So the first port of call to look at close, more closely at this possibility was uh, Warminster in Wiltshire, the great youth focal of the 1960s. And one of the key areas within the, we can call it that, the Warminster window, was Clay Hill, a prehistoric earthwork hill now a focus, of course, for crop uh, circle uh, markings and so forth. Uh, and uh, light phenomena had been seen emerging from and descending into this hill, as well as hovering around and travelling in the sky around it. It had been seen going into the hill, do remember that. If we're going to take into account uh, the statements of abductees, if we're going to take witness testimony at all... I would ask that we also take uh, testimony from witnesses who have seen lights going into the ground and coming out of the ground. There's many such testaments. Well, we upside down, Newman. What we uh, were not expecting in chalk country uh, like Wiltshire was to find any fault lines. And indeed, the whole geological survey map of that area shows only two fault lines. And one, you just have to take my word for it or tip your heads upside down. We have the town of Warminster here. We have a fault line that goes through the town right past Clay Hill. And it's called the Warminster Fault. And it's parallel for a distance with uh, the Longleaf Fault. Um, they're the only two faults on the map. Uh, and so it's a hell of a, a coincidence. So we were quite... Uh, intrigued of that. We went on to look at many other things we can't go into. There have been in both the books that Philip mentioned and if you want to go into the details you'll get them there. Just in brief we looked at places like um, the Barmouth area where there was a good uh, documentary record of light phenomena in 1904-1905 we've looked down here in St Bride's Bay area, the infamous or famous sort of um, uh, triangle of uh, Phenomena uh, in Pembroke in 1977. Uh, and subsequently, we've looked at a number of other small terrain locations, micro-regions within Wales and many other places as well. Taking the, uh, the Barmouth case, um, it was associated with the Welsh religious revival. Um, at least it, well, it occurred at the same time. And the association was made by other people. Uh, but uh, Abram Chapel, for example, the balls of light were seen rising from the fields on either side, running along the hills at the back here, playing over this road surface in front of the chapel. Clanvaya uh, Chapel, further north, near a Harlot, about seven miles north of Abram, uh, balls of light were seen to rise out of this field here. Three red balls of light, about so big, dancing around over this crossroads at Club Bedder. Balls of light were observed coming over the field here, playing around over the surface of the road, uh, also near Club Bedder. A grey oval shape, all 1904, 1905, mainly 1905, February. January, February, March period. Uh, a large oval of grey matter that opened up and beams of light came down on the road here. Witness all these multiple witness cases, incidentally. 
all of them associated with the revival uh, and, and, uh, and religious Christian experience. Um, what we didn't know when we wrote Earthlights, the first Earthlights book, but subsequently found out, is that running right through this area from Barmouth virtually to Harlech is uh, a very important local fault line called the Mokras Fault, which rep- is represented here between the purple and the brown. I'll come back to that. In April 1905, as the phenomena began to subside in um, the Barmouth Harlech region, uh, it started to increase about 40 miles inland up the valley of the Dee in the High Gothland area. And uh, on one particular evening, the local clergy were getting very concerned about this phenomenon, the excitement it was causing with the revivalist uh, movement going on. Uh, positioned themselves on Telford's aqueduct here over the River Dee, and they saw a number of light phenomena being produced in the course of the night. And most of them emerged from these fields here, between those trees and these trees here. And one of the vicars said they were like, they were lurid, like balls of electricity, he said, rising up out of the ground. In most cases, they shimmered and went out. Uh, looked very unstable, but a few, just I think three in all, were observed to come out of the ground, shimmer, shake, then stabilise, get very much brighter, and then fly away. And they flew off out of sight over the ridge that you see there. Then, 1977, around St Bride's Bay, you had a range of phenomena. Uh, and lights were seen descending into stack rocks out in the bay. Uh, this got interpreted as underground UFO bases, uh, spaceships coming down, a sort of James Bond-like uh, doorways in the rocks opening and letting the things in. And a whole range of phenomena occurred, including silver-suited uh, beings moving around, dissolving, coming and going in the fields. A wide range of, of population saw them. Now, uh, we looked at many, many of the sites. The more we looked into it, the more we, we saw that these were not that unusual. Yes, they're exotic, but not that unusual. And that in periods of time, usually short-lived periods, at least this is what we thought initially, uh, small locales became prone to the appearance of light phenomena. So, for example, uh, at... Uh, this little place, this little hamlet in, in Shropshire in 1913, balls of light were seen forming on the northern tower of the church here and uh, rolling down the side and floating off and generally moving about. It was accompanied by apparent poltergeist activity where latches on doors would spring open, furniture would move around in the handful of cottages nearby and columns, gaseous columns, would emerge uh, from the ground, uh, dark in daylight, softly glowing at night, up to about seven feet tall, that drifted around. It's worth remembering that the Barmouth Harlock uh, outbreak, columns of light were seen uh, amongst many other types of phenomena, not just spheres of light, but bars of light, triangles of light, and a whole range of geometric shapes and forms. More cases uh, uh, in, in Warwickshire, churches, uh, balls of light, holy wells, balls of light, valleys, and so on. Other localities all around uh, the country at various times. I'll just read a couple of very brief examples. Um, one relates to an outbreak of light phenomena uh, at the, or near the village of Mir. Um, in the end of the 19th century. Light phenomena were being seen on Mere Down. Uh, they were referred to as Kitty Candlestick, uh, a general name for Will-o'-the-Wisp or whatever. But it's obvious that this was not the phenomenon being seen. For example, one old uh, countryman gives this description of the light he saw. He said, It went across the down like a flash of lightning. By and by it came back again, and we looked at one another a bit. And I said, what, have you lost your way? 
and off he went again. It was a beautiful light, as big as a plate. Mere, mere down, is less than nine miles from Warminster. Bear that in mind. Last century. Or, in another part of the country, in Cambridgeshire, uh, the peasant poet, John Clare, uh, gives an account in his uh, The Journal's Essays and the Journey from Essex, dated 1830, of light phenomena around the village of Helpston in, in Cambridgeshire. There was a great upstir about the lights, but it was only when Clare saw some for himself that he, quote, felt robbed of what little philosophic reasoning which I had about them. Uh, the first light uh, that Clare saw was over Eastwell Green, and he initially took this to be a meteor, but as it became larger and began moving up and down, he observed with increased interest. He saw another light rising in the southeast, as he put it, over Deadmore. The two lights moved towards each other, and they danced and chased around until they mingled into one in a moment, as Clare wrote. Clare specifically noted that the lights flew against stiff winds at times and found it difficult to think of them as vapours. He talked to a woman who had seen up to 15 lights at one time over Eastwell Moor. Then, on one evening, uh, Clare was walking between the villages of Ashton and Helpston, and he encountered one of these lights, and this is his account, in his own inimitable style. He wrote, It came on steadily, and when it got near me, I thought it made a sudden stop as if to listen to me. It blazed out like a wisp of straw, and made a crackling noise like straw burning, which soon convinced me of its visit. The luminous halo that spread from it was of a mysterious, terrific hue, and the enlarged size and whiteness of my own hands frit me. The bushes seemed to be climbing the sky. Everything was extorted out of its own figure and magnified the darkness all around. It seemed to form a circular black wall. I held fast by the style post till it darted away, when I took to my heels and got home as fast as I could. Uh, there are many localities in the British Isles where this type of phenomena has been reported. More interestingly, uh, as we asked more questions, as we got a little closer, for example, round the Havram Forest area of central Wales, where an outbreak occurred while I was producing this book, uh, we found that the shepherds and the farmers there had seen these lights all their lives and their parents before them and just took them as part of the, of the furniture, if you like. What had happened was a sudden increase in the activity and newcomers to the sparsely inhabited area of central Wales um, thought perhaps of some mysterious activities of British aerospace who came every summer to carry out strange experiments in a quarry in the middle of Havron Forest and the Greenpeace people, local Greenpeace people, got very uh, excited about this. Public meetings were called. And because of that, it never got into the UFO literature at all. Though. Because of that, we got to hear about it uh, through BBC reporters and so on. And when we asked questions, it was quite apparent that this particular valley, miles from anywhere, had harboured light phenomena literally for generations, but usually at a lower incidence level, just flared up on this particular uh, occasion, And when we've asked that question more and more in various areas, we find that these areas where lights suddenly appear are a little bit like the crop circles. When attention, particularly media attention, is placed on, a, on an area, you think it's the first time something's happened. But that's not always the case. Uh, elsewhere, for example, the classic case is Hesdalen in Norway, again a valley, um, minerally very rich, where hundreds of photographs have been taken of light phenomena, and curious incidents have occurred. I think I shut through one there. Uh, Leif Havoc's photograph of a light coming over the crest of the mountain. Raw Wister's uh, photograph, he did a sequence as one of a sequence of pictures. And so on. In America, there are said to be over a hundred locations, localized regions where light phenomena occur. Interesting phenomenon in America that these areas are called ghost lights, 
and they have nothing, absolutely nothing to do with UFOs. UFOs are extraterrestrial craft and you have ghost lights and never the twain shall meet. Uh, this is the Yakima Indian Reservation where in the 1970s light phenomena were seen and photographed by uh, reservation rangers, fire wardens and so on and numerous other people, uh, particularly over this ridge of hills uh, that run across the whole reservation. This is in Washington State on the immediate uh, eastern side of the Cascade Mountains. In southern Missouri, around Piedmont, uh, light phenomena occurred intensively. Uh, Harley Rutledge uh, and a university team went into the field and photographed many dozens of these phenomena, observed them, carried out various inquiries. This light runs up and down a road uh, also in Missouri near Joplin, a place called Horn, it's just about on the county line. Uh, Dale Katzmarek has uh, done work on this. He's debunked at least one of these ghost lights, which was uh, a refraction effect by car headlights. But this is said, he observed at close quarters, he observed it through binoculars, photographed it, this is his photograph. Uh, and he said this was the real thing. And the light, when it hovered over grass and moved away, would leave a twinkling effect in the grass after it moved. You could see through it. He said you could see a bush behind it, for example. Probably the most famous ghost light locale in the USA is uh, Marfa in Texas. Actually, most of the phenomena focus on the Chinati Mountains, some miles to the south of Marfa. But on Mitchell Flat and the prairie land around there, lights have been seen for at least 100 years, as this notice on the roadside points out. The Marfa lights, mysterious and unexplained lights that have been reported in the area for over 100 years, have been the subject of many theories. The first recorded sighting of the lights was by rancher Robert Ellison in 1883, variously explained as campfires, phosphorescent minerals, swamp gas, static electricity, St. Elmo's fire and ghost lights. The lights reportedly change colours, move about and change in intensity. Scholars have reported over 75 local folk tales dealing with the unexplained phenomenon. And that, in many ways, sums up the whole thing about light phenomena in certain regions. Uh, this is photograph, a time-lapse photograph taken by James Crocker in 1986, I believe, of light scampering about a few feet above Mitchell Flat at Marfa. They leave curious traces. There's one road that runs down from Marfa to Presidio on the Rio Grande, and this is uh, the lights of a car on that road. So you can compare that against these other light traces. Okay. Just look a little more closely at one or two of those things, and I think uh, perhaps at the characteristics particularly of the lights. We have a phenomenon. It, no doubt by anybody will spend any time looking at the evidence that they exist. But what they are, their relationship to UFOs, as if UFOs are somehow a defined other thing, um, is perhaps more open to debate. But the evidence is there for anybody who cares to check it, that these things do occur. There are even places you can go now with a high chance of, of seeing the lights. We have the ge geography, if you like, of this phenomenon. Now, of its characteristics and the clues that it gives us, uh, perhaps the most dominant is that they seem to be terrain-related. They relate to specific types of countryside wherever the research has been carried out to check this, and it's not been carried out at all the places by any means. So it's, uh, it's an open question in some regards. Going back to Barmouth, uh, Edgar in 1904-1905, after we'd done our detailed exact positioning of light phenomena in that area, uh, very exact, those we couldn't, we kept out of our survey, uh, we then found out about the fault, came later. Uh, and just to give you a couple of indications, the Mockcrass fault runs within 80 feet here of Egrin Chapel. Um, Langbaia Chapel 
is here. Here's the cross for the chapel. You see that the fault line comes up right to it. And that fault line is moving through here. This is Langmire Chapel. So in April, no, sorry, in March 1905, when witnesses saw three balls of deep red light rise from this field, move around, switch and change and merge, fly away, they undoubtedly, although it wasn't known the course of the time, all this is the result of recent surveys last few years, uh, they undoubtedly rose out of the mocker spot. It's not just that these things occurred near faulting, but there's an increase of incidence of such lights as you approach faulting. This shows metres from faulting in 100 metre divisions for the locations we could exactly position between Barmouth and Harlech for 1904-1905 events. And uh, as you can see, the closer we come to the faulting within 100 yards, 100 metres, I suppose, you see the increase. We didn't invent it. You can redo that data yourself if you want. It's, it's accessible. You just have to spend a month or two doing the work. Back down in St. Bride's Bay area uh, in uh, 1977, uh, my colleague Paul McCartney did a, a, a set of studies of that, again picking out the locations where it was possible to do so of certain phenomena and compared it against the detailed geology. It took a long while to do this because the detailed geology of that area has only recently relatively become uh, available. And again, you see a similar pattern. Yes, something happened over one and a half kilometres from surface faulting. We could have had that pattern over there. It's possible. But it's not what we got. That's what occurred. So there seems, on the basis of the work, the sort of work that we've been doing, that there is a preference for these types of mainly light phenomena, I'll come to the other types of phenomena in a short while, to occur closer in to surface faulting, geological faulting. It's also the case here, the vicars who stood on Telford's Vida, we know exactly where they saw the lights emerging from the ground. We've done the work, we've been there, we've asked the questions, we've located the fields. We know. We also know it's riddled with faulting. Indeed, there's a fault that runs through here that's called the viaduct fault. So what does that tell us? This is just one main characteristic. They seem to occur in localised regions for a limited period of time or to haunt certain areas, fields or uh, valleys or little areas of prairie uh, or mountainsides, whatever, perhaps for very long, for generations, maybe longer than that for all we know. The, one of the characteristics of these zones is that they are geologically faulted. And that tells us a number of things. One is that we know that the Earth does produce exotic light forms. For example, earthquake lights that are produced in some, by no means all, earthquakes. I'll repeat this time and again over this hour, uh, that we are not dealing with clockwork. We're dealing with the complexity of nature. If anybody's any doubts about that now... You should be looking at the ecological problems that are occurring as humanity tries to simplify their crop systems, get rid of species. Nature produced complexity for a purpose. Complexity is essential for life to evolve, for phenomena to develop. And we are looking at a complex world, infinitely complex. So when people say, well, that happened there, why didn't that happen there? A people, very primitive approach because they want a clockwork answer to something that's infinitely more subtle and involved than that. However, given that problem, we're still getting some remarkably consistent findings. In earthquakes, light phenomena have been reported for many, many, many years, uh, but it was only in the 1960s that the Matsushiro earthquake swarm that many, many photographs of these light phenomena were taken. This is a ball of light that emerges out of the ground, a great dome of light that appears, uh, and that's just one of a sequence of photographs. Although uh, big earthquakes sometimes don't produce them, very small earthquakes often do. 
a recent book by Greg Long, uh, uh, The Yakima UFO Microcosm, where he states uh, that only large earthquakes produce um, uh, light phenomena. It's not true. Small ones do as well, and often big ones do not. Um, but the fact that now science recognises these phenomena does not explain them. Nobody knows what they are. There are, as yet, no physics that can account for the forms that earthquake lights take. A similar situation occurs with ball lightning, where, again, because of meteorological conditions, so we're told, but who's looked at the geology of ball lightning, I wonder? But because of meteorological conditions, certain charges are developed in the air, uh, and so we get, again, exotic, contained spheres and geometrical forms of light. Ball lightning sounds like we explain it. This is one of the problems we have with science. When a scientist gives a name to something, the Medan plasma vortex, what the hell is it? It's just a name that a scientist has given for something they don't understand. I've worked with scientists on the Dragon Project. We had phenomena such as uh, uh, ultrasound that we could pick up with a small instrument not much larger than this. When we went into a particular stone circle, he cut out. This was repeated five times. I said, what the hell is this? The scientist, very eminent scientist with me, actually said, well, let's call it the zero field effect. He said, that way it doesn't sound like we, we don't know anything about it. He actually said that to me. You know? <laughs> so always be cautious of the scientists. And the adulation we're seeing in various quarters, I don't think represented here today, but in some quarters for the mead and vortex, to a too great a degree, it's a very important development and insight, but it's not an answer to a large range of stuff we're looking at. Uh, a close cousin, and I think we're looking at a family of phenomena here, a close cousin to earthquake light is mountain peak discharge, where columns and balls and other shapes of light are seen coming from certain mountain peaks and mountain ranges and have been for a century or more. And Mount Athos, they interpreted as signs of the of Virgin Mary in Greece. Uh, Pendle Hill, not so very far from here, uh, is a hill associated with witchcraft, light bulb phenomena, spiritual visions, the appearance and disappearance of entities or images, very, very briefly, transient images of strange little creatures and so on. A holy hill, if you like. Uh, looking from Barmouth, we have Kada Idris, the legendary Kada Idris, where in 1982 I personally saw a ball of light emerge from the wall of uh, the volcanic mountain, which stands on the Bala Fault. Uh, Mount Taishan, for example, in China, they actually built a temple to observe the orange balls of light that play around the peak. Mount Shasta, uh, in California, Northern California, has exactly the same range of phenomena associated with it as Pendle Hill. They're almost identical, but the same sort of description. Figures appearing and disappearing. Balls of light. Strange columns of light. It was the Indian holy hill, mountain, 14,000 feet, and so on. Interestingly, uh, Shasta is the southernmost peak of the Cascade Mountains. Linked with faulting, up in the northwest area of the uh, state. And of course, we associate it nowadays primarily with the explosion of Mount St. Helens in 1980. That just indicates the uh, seismic volatility of this area. It's on two great tectonic plates that are slowly grinding and working their way together. So they are um, unstable seismically. And, of course, it was flying between these peaks of the Cascades that uh, Kenneth Arnold saw his flying disks. Uh, it's even nine years after the event, it still looks something like that in the region of uh, Mount St. Helens. Also close by is the Yakima Indian Reservation. You can see Mount Adams and Goat Rocks at the end of this ridge. And it's over Goat Rocks, over which Kenneth Arnold's lights flew and hoped the terrain. And now we have... UFOs here, or whatever we have. The ridge is heavily faulted, by the way. So, what do we have? Well, what can this mean? Well, these are zones where faulting occurs. You have areas of pressure. You have areas where great energies have been released in the Earth's crust. You have uh, a an energy basis for phenomena, perhaps, to arise. A number of other things I'll come on to later. 
One of the theories that has emerged, and the prime uh, author of this is Michael Persinger of Laurentian University. He has suggested what we're looking at uh, is the result of tectonic stress, stress fields caused by pressures building up and sometimes relaxing within the Earth's crust. This happens all the while. It happens at a full moon, for example, apart from anything else. It doesn't always result in an earthquake, but massive pressures are created, generated, and sometimes relax, sometimes will cause a tremor, sometimes will cause an earthquake. depends on the nature and the weakness and strengths of any individual area of geology. Uh, in the case of the Hestalen material, they actually were able, a very rare piece of information, to run a seismographic uh, instrumentation at the same time as they were carrying out visible sightings of UFOs. And using their most exotic, not just any old lights, but their most exotic lights, the ones they really couldn't explain, which are represented for this month in which this two-pronged observation is taking place, represented by the white column. Um, the seismographs information represented by the black columns. We can see uh, a nodding relationship, shall we say, between the... Uh, intensities of both or incidence rates of both lights and local seismographic uh, indications. This sort of material is very rare. So maybe there's something in Persinger's tectonic strain theory or hypothesis. It is a theory because the man is looking at data, he's processing, he's looking, he's asking it a question and I've got to say if you go into that data it's not bad. It's not bad at all. In some cases, it's very good. But it isn't conclusive. It's a very interesting theory. It doesn't tell us a thing about the light, other than that maybe tectonic strain is associated with their appearance. There may be extraterrestrials using that energy. It doesn't even dismiss that possibility. But to deny it and to throw it out of hand is not the act of anybody who claims that they're involved with ufology. You can't do it. The evidence is there, and it's good basic evidence, but it's not conclusive. Not proof, it's just evidence. Now, another aspect that we've noted, and this has crept upon us unawares, but it's very obvious when you think about it, is that in many of the zones where we see light phenomena, we also find old mine workings. Well, in faulted areas, you get high mineralization. The upheavals of the earth have thrown up mineral deposits. That's why you get uh, mines and you get quarries, often running and mimicking uh, the direction of faulting across country because it's been brought up to the surface more accessible. In areas where you get this type of uh, mineralization, seis seismically generated mineralization, if you like, uh, you will get changes in magnetism and, and uh, uh, electrical resistance and all sorts of things. Indeed, modern ways of finding faulting is now to use electromagnetic detection because of the variations that occur. These are lead mines near Grasmere, and uh, again, they're one of the focus, or one of the foci for light phenomena there. And this is Black Down, uh, sorry, Down Ridge on Dartmoor, where in 1915, for a six month period, lights were seen popping out of the slopes here and drifting off or wandering away. Uh, there is disused lead mines on. Uh, tin mines, I beg your pardon, on that particular slope. And this is quite interesting because we've come across 18th century texts now which uh, give uh, accounts of tinners and copper miners in the previous centuries who used to look for balls of light emerging from the ground to tell them where a vein of copper or tin might be located. It's in the literature, it's there. Uh, and they used to use light. And if it was a light as big as a man's head, it'd be a really good vein of copper or tin down there. Uh, so we have, have that sort of usage of light phenomena emerging from the ground, consciously and directly related to underground minerals. In a small Welsh town where light phenomena regularly occurs, blue lights pop out of the hills every so often. Almost the entire population have seen these, and they take them pretty much for granted. There's two explanations. One is that they're fairies up on the hills, which everybody will say with a smile. Uh, the other is that uh, they're to do with the minerals in the hills. So that sort of memory of mineralogy and light phenomena still exists. It's still a living tradition in this country. 
some Bright's Bay area, Bournemouth area. These are magnetic contours. Uh, you can see the clustering of these two regions because of the faulting, because of the mineralogy around the faulting. I don't want to make a big issue of this. It's an element, but it's certainly not conclusive, nor does it happen in all cases. It just doesn't. Another area we're looking at at the moment, in Cornwall there are areas of light phenomena taking place currently, and uh, the locals there don't talk about UFOs, and they don't talk about, well they do talk about fairies, or at least they used to, but they tend to talk now about radon. Oh well, they're balls of radon, my dear, aren't they? That's what they are, balls of radon. Everybody has their local mythology for them. And we have now got reliable reports of light, small-scale light phenomena occurring in some of the prehistoric uh, sites uh, in Cornwall and elsewhere where there's high radon counts. There's also effect on consciousness that's proving very interesting. Another characteristic of the zones, the terrains associated with lights, are water bodies, particularly reservoirs, but uh, locks, lakes and so on also. Uh, Longdon Dale, of course, the valley of Longdon Dale, uh, one of the key foci of light phenomena that uh, David Clark and Andy Roberts' uh, Project Pennine has revealed. This is one of the reservoirs in the base of that valley. Uh, the, the series of the necklace of reservoirs overlay fault lines, in, in fact, and a great amount of extraordinary light phenomena has occurred in that area. UNESCO have a directive that where reservoirs are created, there should be a close watch for micro tremors, because some major disasters in the 60s occurred by filling up valleys for reservoir purposes and then great earthquakes occurring with, with tragic consequences. Great weights and bodies of water create seismic stress. Another characteristic of these regions is that often there is an isolated upright, a charge collector, if you like, around which some of the light phenomena seem to gravitate. Again, in the Project Pennine studies, Alderley Moore TV tower has been one of uh, such foci. Uh, but if you think about it, isolated, remember these houses are modern, isolated uh, chapels on fault lines in 1904-1905 also can act as a charge collector. At Edgrin Chapel, for example, lights were seen playing across the gables of the chapel and various other places where, where lights have occurred. Just to get through, I won't go into the details. Another very curious characteristic of Earth light zones, if I can call them that, uh, is that black shapes are often seen. I've seen one of these myself in 1967. Total black, without light. Uh, the one I saw was over fields uh, in Sussex. Um, it was round, whether it was a hole, whether it was a flat thing on edge, or whether it was a sphere, I don't know. Total black in brilliant sunshine. It just disappeared, appeared two fields further away, and off it went into the sun glare. Uh, in this case, Devil's Elbow, again, part of the project, Pennine study. Big, black, slug-like shape, completely without light, just to seem to slide across... Uh, the road in front of the motorcyclist. And there are historical accounts of black, strange black shapes seen moving over uh, the moorland. Black shapes without lights in areas where light phenomena occur, almost like an anode diode effect, perhaps, I don't know. Okay. Other characteristics which will lead us into a few exotic areas. Um, on, off. The lights seem to be there in the way that when you sit in a, in a cinema, you're looking at a movie, everything seems to be moving. It seems to be moving on the screen because you've got a lot of still pictures thrown up by 24 frames every second because of your, mine, our persistence of vision, uh, an optical effect, the thing seems to move in continuous motion, although it's fat a lot of rapid still images. Uh, and we see a light phenomenon, if we're lucky enough, uh, and it seems to be continuous. But we have a few clues that this is not the case. For example, this light, seen over the Pinnacles Fault, four miles from the San Andreas Fault in California, photographed by physicist David Kubrick, as he observed this light rushing by treetop high, he noticed 
that it was creating shock waves in the air ahead of it. Then it stopped. They said it was impossible. Nothing with any mass moving at that speed could just stop without deceleration. So this isn't physics, but there it was happening. It started to spin when he just started taking this photograph, and it just dissolved. It spun and dissolved into the air. But it was something that had been moving, looked like a solid, brilliantly lit form that uh, created shockwaves. Then it acted, so presumably it had mass. When it stopped, it stopped without deceleration, as if it had no mass. Well, similar thing occurred on Project Hesdalen. Four of the Hesdalen team were watching a light moving over the valley. It seemed to be a continuous light. They were actually scanning it with radar at the same time. And the radar signal was going on and off very rapidly. But to the naked eye, it seemed to be a continuous light. Well, in uh, Earthlight's revelation, you'll see a photograph uh, kindly uh, given to us for reproduction by former police sergeant uh, Anthony Dodd. Very kind of him. A remarkable photograph he took over Carlton Moore, two lights lighting up the cloud base of the head. Because we had a first generation print of this from Mr. Dodd, uh, I showed this to an American theoretical physicist, Fred Allen Wolfe. And he took him three seconds to notice something very interesting I hadn't seen, and I didn't think anybody else had noticed, on the photographs. I've taken the liberty of copying Mr. Dobbs. Dodd's photograph to, to show you. Uh, it's not as good as the original. You would have to look at the reproduction of the book to see it as clearly. But if you look very closely, there's something interesting about these lights. You see there's a little dip here. On close examination, there's a fine black line runs up the middle. The same thing happens here. He said, do you see the line? I said, yeah. What's that? He said, it's interference with the shutter of the camera. He said, these things were going on and off. Very, very rapidly. He then went into some technical physics that I confess I can't follow. He said, there's more of this thing back here so that we can't see with optical instrumentation. He said, but that thing is going on and off. So we're getting a few hints that the lights are not actually constant. They are vibrating. They're just manifesting on the very edge of creation, if you like. Okay. A few other factors about the lights. Their size. They usually occur about this size. The classic description, two classic descriptions for, for the light phenomena for Earth lights. One is that they are about the size of a basketball or that they're like a Chinese lantern. Those two descriptors occur again and again and again in witness literature. But they can be small, size of a fist or a golf ball, or they can be several metres across. And I've actually heard people say, well, these are one thing, UFOs are something else. You know, we get this sort of uh, complaint. Anybody telling me a ball of light metres across cannot be mistaken for a UFO, whatever a UFO is, I would beg to disagree. Uh, recently, these things were seen coming out of the ground, for example, in a low-level earthquake in Canada. Uh, so, but their constant size is usually around that. That's the average, but they can be bigger and they can be smaller. Uh, colours. Their most dominant colour is amber, golden sort of colour. Uh, but there are other colours. White is, is a common colour. And often white lights seen close up seem to have a reddish hint, core, to them. Uh, but all colours have been reported. Uh, but greens and blues are relatively rare. Amber, orange, red are the most common. Physical effects. The lights, light ball lightning, uh, seem able to leave marking on vegetation. They can singe uh, leaves, grass, leave marks. Definitely can do this. Uh, there's energy from them. Now, this is a very important factor because if you go back into the anthropological literature... All indigenous peoples have records around the world of these lights, which they normally interpret in terms of spirit. Now, the Wintu Indians, whose territory crossed the San Andreas Fault in California, called the lights spirit eaters. You didn't go near them because they would eat your spirit. Uh, around Darjeeling, the lights were known as Chota Admi, the little men carrying the lanterns. And you didn't go near those either, otherwise you'd die or become very ill. 
But as with ball lightning, people who have got near ball lightning have felt electrical charge, have felt various effects. In some cases, the lights have come up and touched people and there's been no ill effect. Some people have gone near earth light phenomena and have unquestionably been burnt and been affected and affected in other ways I'll mention in a moment. Uh, there can be effects. Why it varies, God only knows. I don't. Uh, but uh, maybe we can say there are different frequencies involved, different circumstances, who knows what. But sometimes, and in certain areas repeatedly, it's bad news to go near the light. Things will happen to you. Things will happen to the physical environment. So there can be physical effects. The light quality of the light has various uh, characteristics. One is that when people do get close enough to see, without passing out, being burnt, or other things happening to them, the light seems to be teeming inside. Although a coherent shape, it's teeming with that inner activity, like wriggles, worms, tapes, whatever, of light going on within this otherwise beautiful moon-like exterior. The light is... In most cases, eight out of every ten descriptions, I would say, states that the light, although bright, did not hurt the eyes. It did not give off rays. Uh, it's a repeated uh, account. Brightness, but of a curious quality to the light. It might light up the environment, but it, it's not glaring. It's different uh, to uh, a light that one would normally uh, expect. The light, in a few rare cases, has been described, perhaps about 2, 3, 4% of, of the known reports, has been described as going in one direction only. And if you move round the back, as it were, of the light, you don't see it at all. Come round again, and it's moving in one direction. We're dealing with very exotic physics here, of that observation, which spans certainly this whole century and around the world, is, is accurate. Uh, the lights are often, when seen close to, transparent. They're translucent, at least. Objects can sometimes be made out behind them. The Kathy Davis case of, of Bud Hopkins, for example, the uh, bird feeder is seen behind the ball of light that uh, precedes the events that, uh, that Bud describes thereafter. Um, so in that sense, it's a classic earth light observation. Uh, widely reported for people who get close to the light is a buzzing, whistling sound from the light and sometimes a pressure, a sense of pressure, uh, prickling of the skin, of hair and so on. It seems to be a static field effect. Uh, so they are the immediately recognisable effects that occur again and again and again to the point now where those of us who have spent the time, the years and the effort looking at it can now recognise a certain set of characteristics, and there's some of the more obvious ones. So what we can say about earth light, in brief summary, I'll come to that in a minute, is that they seem to be geologically framed phenomena as far as current research can tell us. They are terrain-related. They occur in zones when they occur. Sometimes they may fly off out of that zone, but when they do, there's other lights being produced or occurring in their point of origin. Uh, they, in many cases, have occurred for generations in those locations. They have specific recognisable aspects, some of which I've just indicated. But there's, they are at least, I would say, unfamiliar forms of known energy, some unfamiliar concatenation of electromagnetism. But it's also possible that they are an unknown energy form which has electromagnetic side effects, and we have to be open to that possibility. I'm not one of the great believers in science who says the science knows everything. It knows bugger all. We have a huge universe out of there, and we've hardly scratched the surface. We live with two great mysteries. One is called nature, and the other is and almost everything. But she suggested, for example, that these types of phenomena may be more mundane than extraterrestrial uh, craft. I don't think so. I think they're more exotic. Even if we assume there are extraterrestrial craft, which there may or may not be, these things are more exotic than that because they have one very, very exotic characteristic. And that characteristic is they behave as if they have a modicum of intelligence. And this puts us into funny country. 
uh, because the people who are trying to demonstrate this electromagnetically are always on a loser. They are on a bummer, I promise you. They'll never get there. On the same way, in my own view, it's my personal view, you take it or leave it, I'm sure many of you will leave it, but actually, you know, I think the extraterrestrials are on an equal bummer as well. I think, uh, I mean, I think Roswell is really Alamo. I mean, I think that's, that's the, the problem they'll find ultimately there. They've been working at it for 40 years, maybe they'll get there. Maybe they're extraterrestrials, but these things have properties. For example, on Mitchell Flats, Two in the 1970s, two geologists chased lights, balls of lights in a jeep, and these things played tag with them. At the end of this extraordinary escapade, one of the uh, Kinney, one of the uh, geologists said, Look, he said, I don't care what you think about me, what you might say, but these things definitely had intelligence and they were playing games. They'd run around a bush, wait till we got up, dart off again, leap into the air, coalesce, part company, off they go again and so on and so forth. The ancients called them spirits. That's how they chose to describe them. And it's there in the anthropological, ethnographic literature. You can go in there and the lights are clear. West Africa, they're aku, they're devil. You don't go near those either. And they can disappear into the water, into the lakes, and glow under the water. Their behaviour response, the the Missouri people, the Hesdalen people of all said that there is a certain percentage, 9-10% of the lights, that did seem to respond to them, to their teams, to individual people, even possibly their thoughts. In Utah in the 1970s, uh, researchers there also got the same sort of response. Now, if I've got a smooth tabletop and I've got a magnet here and a ball bearing here, and the ball bearing starts rolling to the magnet, and you don't know anything about magnetism, it might say, God... The ball bearing is intelligent, you know, it's gone out to this piece of metal. So we have to be careful not to read too much into this, and I think one can read apparent intelligence into random behaviour. I don't doubt that, I'm absolutely sure of that. But I'm also equally convinced, in looking at the data, and having observed two or three cases of these phenomena myself personally, that we are dealing with something that behaves either in one of two ways. It either has a primitive, basic, rudimentary intelligence of its own, uh, because the lights are often inquisitive. They'll come, they'll look, they'll play, they skip like a kitten, like a dolphin, if you like. They have that type of skittish uh, inquisitiveness. Or they are somehow a, a field phenomenon which temporarily and perhaps only partially manifests in invisible light that also can interact in terms of consciousness. Ah! Well, somebody complained yesterday about talking about psychology. And if you think you're going to get the, through the UFO mystery without talking about psychology, without talking about consciousness, you are sadly deluded in my personal opinion. We will have to take on board these areas, not of human knowledge, but of human ignorance. We know so little about the mind, you know, Uh, I think it was Jung who said, we go around with this great entity, the subconscious, about which we know practically nothing. And so we're going to have to look very closely at consciousness. Consciousness, I feel, comes up in two ways with Earthlight's research. One is that, uh, as Persinger has suggested, that if you get near these lights on some occasions, depending on whatever the circumstances might be, you'll have physical changes... Field effects will occur on your body that will particularly occur, depending on whether, whether it's a positive or negative field, will affect your shoulder area or it will affect your genital area. This, this is not something person or invent. This is quite categoric neurophysiological information. And uh, if you've ever been asleep at night, you've been dreaming about crawling through a desert looking for water or whatever, and you wake up and you realise you've got to go to the bathroom and have a pee, you'll know how into internal imagery physiological signals can be uh, injected. And what's being suggested by Persinger and others is that if you get near the light in certain electromagnetic fields, particularly magnetic fields, the hippocampal region of the brain is affected. And in the hippocampal uh, area, the temporal lobe area, you also have the amygdala, which affects feeling, and you also have the language centres of the brain. And 
language and dream consciousness is highly interrelated. And, and dream researchers have really discovered this, particularly in the last 10 years. These are closely related phenomena, and they can be affected by very mild electromagnetic fields of the right frequency and so on. So it's at least conceivable that as you get near the light, things will trigger in certain people. Like some people have epilepsy that affect the same zone. Other people don't. And some people can be triggered into epilepsy that have never had it before if they sit in front of a stroboscopic light, for example. External phenomena can trigger internal mental states. And these mental states can be incredibly vivid and powerful. And uh, despite what Bud was saying yesterday, if you really look at abduction material, and Jung was doing it, you know, 20 years ago, more. He was already identifying clear imagery that recurs. Yes, it'll have a different coat on, but the imagery is quite recognisable. The skeleton is still there. They really are repetitive images that occur. But as with your dreams, you get your you get profound sort of common imagery emerging in dreams that are coloured, tinctured, hued by your life experience, your cultural experience and so on. So if you come in contact with a field, and this can be done in the laboratory, don't kid yourselves that it can't, it can. And you can be triggered into altered states. And I'm not saying that every abduction and every mystical experience is to do with an earth light. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying here's one potential external source in nature that can trigger this. So the earth lights may affect consciousness by their field effect, whatever that might be. But I also am harboring the terrible... I say it's terrible because I've been knocked black and blue just making the suggestion about earth lights over the last decade. But um, I, I have no option in honesty other than to say that I'm quite sure these lights have some relationship in themselves with consciousness, which brings us to the whole question of what is the nature of consciousness? Is it just an electrical effect producing the darkness of our skulls, or is it more a field effect like light, like the air we breathe, and we have organs in our body to cope with that? These are very heretical assumptions. Uh, and I think the reason that the UFO enigma will remain an enigma uh, in for a long while until we really understand our geophysics a little better and understand our minds a little better. And I think we're, as a culture, we're very ignorant of both those areas. In terms of understanding of our minds. Uh, and it causes problems. And if people do still have a problem, thought that a ball of energy, light, could possibly have consciousness, here's a thought. That all of us sitting here and everybody everywhere else are the product of biological and geological and electromagnetic phenomena. That's what our bodies, as bodies, as physical things are. But where is consciousness? Cut any one of us up. Well, horrible thought, but you know, cut it up. There's no consciousness in there. You can't find it. You can't get it out. Where, what is consciousness? Maybe it's interaction. Maybe it's many things. We've got a lot to look at. Okay, finally... Um, in the literature, in the witness testimony, we do have, taken from around the world, an account of lights forming. They usually appear, and it's very rare to be human, it's one thing to see a light in the sky, it's another thing to see the lights come out of the ground. But there are perhaps a hundred cases that we know of where this has been witnessed. The lights appear as flickering effects in the grass, a candlelight effect, as one witness said, a column of light, visible light, is often produced. Various things happen sometimes within or to that column. In the classic case of earth light formation, a sphere or an ovoid of light glowing will start appearing at the top end of that column. Uh, and it will be very unstable and will often flutter and go out. But sometimes will build up in brightness. And when that happened, and this is being reported, uh, on a number of occasions, the light will move up, trailing behind part of, if you like, that umbilical cord. And you're driving a big truck, and this light shoots over, and it looks like a crack with a, a searchlight beam coming down from it. And it's invariably at a certain angle, it's over 30 degrees. That's ideal, but nature isn't ideal, otherwise we'd all look like Grecian gods and goddesses, but most of us do not. Uh, but... Uh, 
the pattern is there. Sometimes there's no column of light. Sometimes there's only a column of light. Sometimes a ball of light will just spring into manifestation above the ground. Maybe there's a non-optical light connector there. Sometimes a blob of light will be seen sitting on the ground, a bit like an amoeba, often with teeming inner activity. It may even move slowly, but mostly they do not. There are variations on the theme, but the basic Earth-like production follows something of that sort of area. What is the work going on? Well, one of the areas is the Persinger tectonic strain hypothesis type of work, which is basically a statistical study from data. It has strengths and it has weaknesses. But it's interesting work and it's producing some good results. It's producing some results that are not so good. But it's an interesting area of work and why shouldn't he work on that? There's another area, laboratory work. Lights can be produced in the laboratory. It's Brian Brady's shots of lights being produced from a rock crusher. We've done similar work in years past. Over here, this is John Merrick's photograph of a light trace moving around inside a rock crusher chamber. There's a big column of granite there being pressured. Most recent work indicates that it's nothing to do with uh, uh, electrical activity or electrical properties in the rock, piezoelectricity, uh, because non piezo rocks produce it. They can produce the lights in a vacuum, they can produce the lights in various gases, they can produce light underwater. And when it occurs underwater, uh, Brady and Rowell and others have noticed that uh, there are chemical breakups in the water where the lights appear. Uh, and it is just possible that we're looking at here a mechanism from the rock body of the Earth itself, whereby perhaps the Precambrian soups were first uh, injected, if you like, with energy to produce the first forms, the amino acids and so on, that led to life. If that was true, then the old traditions and legends are true, uh, that Earth is the mother of life, that she gave birth. It didn't come on comets, it didn't come on meteorites, but it came out of the actual body of the Earth. Nice thought. Not proved, it's just a possibility. Rock has a six-inch piece of, uh, of rose quartz producing light. and You can produce light. The nature of the light is contentious. Nobody quite knows what it is. It gives very curious spectra. Uh, another area of research going on in, into the Earth lights type of thing is historical research. In the 18th century, the founding fathers of both the Royal Society and the Royal Academy, one pleasant evening on the terrace at Windsor Castle, saw an extraordinary phenomenon which was heavily described verbally and uh, also was, as you see here, engraved. Uh, and stuff like the miners' law of, of seeing balls of light emerge from the ground folklore, folk tales, place names, all these things, particularly in known active Earth-like locales, very important to dig away at that sort of material. Another aspect of, of, of landscape studies is the study of ancient sites, which increasingly, more and more, as we investigate, seem to have certain types seem to be associated with uh, the occurrence of light phenomena. All these places have had light phenomena seen around them. They all relate to faulting in the typical earth lights type um, uh, environment, ge geological and geographical environment. Uh, then we have uh, earth light, uh, sorry, crop circles. Not much to say here. I try to keep clear of it. It's, it's, a, it's a confounded mystery. Um, this is the Leicestershire one, was it last year, the year before, taken by James uh, Pickering. Um, I came in contact with Earthlight and crop circles together when we were doing research at Avebury. We were looking at this account of a 1983 sighting of a ball of light that came down within the ring of stones at Avebury Henge. Um, it was seen by a, a lifelong inhabitant of Avebury village, and indeed her family had been there for generations, very stable woman, a moonlight light descending, just disappearing when it touched the grass. Uh, while we were there carrying out research on a whole other matter to do with Silbury Hill, we saw some of the crop circles there last year, and uh, there were local reports of orange balls of light being seen over that field and so on. 
Only at that point did I really say, well, maybe there's some connection here. Um, a few years ago, this gentleman had given us some information. He's from uh, the Antipodes, shall I say, uh, about it, apparently unrelated matter that just got stored and filed away, uh, but suddenly became relevant in terms of crop circle uh, possibilities. And we had to search literally all around the world, in India, and finally located him in Ireland. He was just passing through. And we got a, a set of data out of him that's now led to investigations currently uh, being commenced in South America that I think will quite possibly have a bearing and a relationship on the crop circle energy phenomenon. And it's quite at an angle to all the other work that we've been hearing about over the last year or so. Finally, last couple of minutes, uh, earth lights and the ETH and ufology. The first thing I think has to be stated